thoughts and introductions from some of the folks uh, behind the Temporary Safe Outdoor Shelter. And then we're going to get to your questions, comments, et cetera, et cetera. So, so happy that you've joined us here today. Uh, uh, what, a, what a beautiful day to all be coming together uh, to experience this. We will ask you all, as, uh, as Emmy just did, to kindly uh, mute yourselves and keep your cameras off. Um, if you're joining us by video until it's your turn to speak. And I'm gonna do my best uh, to let us hear from as many folks as possible. We do have some people who have called in and we are going to make room. We're go going to pay attention. I'm gonna pay attention and uh, make sure that we hear from you as well. Okay, so to get us rolling today, I am really pleased to introduce one of our county commissioners, Dave Strohmeyer. Dave. Thanks, Brooke. So uh, for everyone out there, I am Dave Strohmeyer. I am chair of the Missoula Board of County Commissioners and I'm so delighted to welcome all of you to this event today and also welcome you on behalf of uh, not only Missoula County as a whole, but my colleagues who are on this line, uh, County Commissioner Josh Slotnick and County Commissioner Winita Vero. We'll have an opportunity to hear from, uh, in just a moment, Hope Rescue Mission and the United Way. You'll hear some of the stories of how for many folks, uh, this has been a transformative point in their life, being able to find shelter at the TSOS. And so as we look ahead to the future and how there might be transitions on the horizon, uh, this is a great opportunity to take stock of where we have been over the past number of months and seek your thoughts uh, on the future of where we might go uh, going forward. So with that, uh, and I would just add, Missoula County has been a proud partner in this undertaking, and we're glad to have uh, been able to lend the assistance that we have had. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce Susan Haypatrick, uh, Executive Director of the United Way, and Jim Hicks with Hope Rescue Mission. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Um, Jim, should we use, we didn't really practice, but do you want me to go first? Um, well, I, thanks, Brooke, too. I, I think the public statements about the TSOS that you've read in the press uh, or seen on TV speak for themselves in terms of moving residents from home, homelessness into housing. I think it's resulted in better outcomes for camp residents and the overall community. I do want to address some common misperceptions about the TSOS and try to make four points in three minutes. So first, we never promised that the space would close by March 31st. People may be confusing the TSOS with the Johnson Street shelter with which we are not affiliated. That was set to close March 31st, but was extended till April 30. The TSOS never had an established end date and has been tied to the duration of the emergency declaration and the pandemic. So we, we never said it would be dismantled by March 31st. Um, we also said that the reserve, we never said rather that the reserve street encampment would be cleared out and closed with residents relocated to the TSOS. The TSOS has always been offered as a legal, safe, healthier alternative to Reserve Street, but neither United Way nor Hope Rescue is in the forced relocation business. The Montana Department of Transportation owns the Reserve Street property. No question, it is a serious issue and a working group of public and private officials meets weekly, including with MDOT, to try to come up with solutions. Um, it isn't true that those of us who set up the TSOS intended all along for it to be extended long-term, that we just kind of snuck it in there forever. We can't stop people from thinking that, but we know that is not true. We had no idea whether the project would work, but its success and support for its continuation from everyone involved, public and private entities, have led us to propose continuing it as part of Missoula's overall ongoing response to homelessness. And finally, one thing that's been made clear to me during the pandemic and since the advent of the TSOS is that those of us who work on housing and homelessness issues need to do a better job communicating our challenges and successes, not just in terms of the TSOS, but in terms of everything we do. 
We've lost ground during COVID. We have a lot of challenges, but also successes in ending homelessness one life at a time. Um, but we've spent too much time talking to each other. We can't criticize other people for being in an echo chamber and be in one ourselves. So you'll see better communication from us going forward and a restructured reaching home leadership team. So thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Susan. Hey, Patrick and everyone else on this call, that, because uh, as Susan is saying, this is a, uh, an important issue uh, for our community. And just let me uh, piggyback on what uh, Susan was talking about. When we first started, uh, the date of March 31st was thrown out there. The reason for that is because the ESG grant looked like it was going to end around that time. So th that's, that's the reason we used that date. Uh, it, it was really dependent upon uh, the emergency edict for COVID uh, and the funding. And so that's, it's unfortunate that that date somehow, I mean, we said it because that's what we understood is the end of March, but then that just really kind of became a mile marker that people were, were looking to where actually it was driven by COVID and the emergency edict. Right. Um, we did say we had funding through March 31st, but fortunately right. it was extended. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that for the residents that have been out there and those that we've been able to help, and I don't know if we'll get to all those numbers today, uh, but th that's, that's the whole purpose of this, not to have another encampment necessarily, but an encampment that will help people move forward. We wanted to provide that safe place. They could leave, they could come back, their stuff would be there. They could have case managers that would meet them on site, we would have a service rich environment to help those that wanted to go forward to move forward. And our, our results have, have shown that um, it, it's been it's been great to see. So uh, I know there's lots of questions. I know there's lots of challenges. Um, this is a this is a challenge for all of us to uh, roll up our sleeves and uh, and do the best we can. So just want to be. Uh, open to what everything is going on and uh, be able to ask questions as they as they come up. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you to the the partners here, the county, United Way, many donors, uh, individuals that have helped. Uh, thank you to our, our staff at Hope Rescue Mission that's worked diligently. And uh, thank you to the community for uh, hearing and understanding and, and walking and working, working through this with us. Um, so with that, Brooke, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Jim, Susan, and uh, and Dave uh, for, for that wonderful introduction. And I just want to note that we now have about 70 participants in this virtual space, which is just really uh, heartwarming uh, to see uh, all of this participation. So let me just talk uh, for a brief minute about what's going to happen next. This is an opportunity for folks to chime in, to comment, to ask questions. And uh, a couple of things that we all know, we all know this, that uh, in order for for us to really, really listen to each other, uh, there are some important things. Um, using I statements instead of you statements, like I feel this or I'm impacted by this instead of you did this and you did that. Those kinds of things just really, really help us listen to each other. And there's room for everybody at this table. Uh, we may not have time to get through uh, everyone today, and we'll talk about some other options for offering support. Uh, but we've got a really great, uh, wonderful, full full house. Everybody's here with, uh, with good hearts and, uh, and good minds. We have folks joining us on phone. And I'm just going to do my best to make sure that uh, we get as many voices heard as possible today. Uh, so what we're going to ask you to do is if you wish to speak up, if you wish to ask a question or to provide a comment, uh, uh, please use the raise hand feature that is uh, on your icon bar uh, that's right along with your video um, your video your video icon and your microphone icon um, and uh, I will scan 
and look for folks uh, to call on and I can, uh, and periodically um, I will ask for some uh, phone, uh, to see if anybody out there on the phone would like an opportunity. Uh, okay, uh, Noah Castle, we're gonna invite you to unmute yourself and, um, and, and uh, speak up. Greetings, Noah. Okay, can, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, yes, great, sir. Great. Um, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna take up a bunch of time. I've, I've, I've kind of done this a few times before, but I just want to kind of talk about, um, I understand all the things that have been said here so far about the, the you know, the mission behind this whole thing. And um, I just have a couple of things about uh, the definitions of success and how sometimes the success of a few good stories uh, leads people to ignore what goes on around it that's not so successful, which is, uh, I hate to say this, but I spoke with Jim uh, not too long ago at the last meeting I was at. And at that meeting, it was the, you know, the kind of the same seven stories I'm hearing about the seven people that have been helped, which is wonderful. We all love that. Um, I'm beating a dead horse here with the 700 other stories around the area that aren't as hopeful, that are, you know, <laughs> drug needles in our parking lot and people sleeping outside, people sleeping in the bank space next door inside the vestibule. We have this massive problem, but when it comes to the stories of success, I want to know about where they go from here. At the last meeting, I asked Jim, what is the long-term plan? And I don't mean for that facility, but for these people. So we've got people coming to Missoula in droves and we have a small place to stay where you guys are at, but we don't have enough room. And then once they're there, where do they go from that point? Missoula's got a major housing crisis. We have a major shortage on uh, low income housing, places that for these people to go. So as the entire Northwest, you know, transients and homeless people come into Missoula, to get help at a shelter like this, then what? You know, Missoula is a wonderful place, but Missoula is in Montana, which is not the safest place seasonally. You know, we've got cold, harsh winters, and I have a feeling we're bringing people here and they don't all have a place to go. And I know that don't, you know, you only had one time that the police got called to your location. However, ask the businesses, ask the people around the community in the area, how many times we've had to call the cops, how many problems we've had. The stories inside your facility are wonderful. The stories outside of it are not wonderful and there are lots of them. And I'm thinking that the more and more and more and more we go through this, the more we just get ignored. And I'm kind of getting emotional and tired of just everybody telling me how great this thing is. And I keep hearing you guys say that the uh, community, the residents around, have not uh, expressed concerns about the impact. I read that in the Missoulian article on Sunday. Well, who are you guys interviewing? Who are we talking to? I, every time I talk to somebody, they're frustrated and worried. And, you know, Bob over at Eagle Storage is cleaning up human feces on the sidewalk every day. And I'm cleaning up our parking lot. I'm picking people out of our establishment. My employees are not happy to come to work anymore. We have a logbook, an incident logbook that we never had before. Every single day, I got to put something in that logbook. So tell me how successful that is when everybody, everything around it outside of this facility is being ignored. And that's, I just want to know how we're dealing with this in the long term and what the plan is, because I'm not seeing anything that's making me happy about my living in that neighborhood with my children and trying to keep my employees safe. I'm no, Noah, thank you so much. Um, and I really hate to cut you off, but we now have 75 folks. And um, do you feel like you got your, I heard you uh, asking what the long-term plan was for people. I'm wondering if uh, any, it, it, do we have any, um, anybody would like to respond to that? I would like to respond to that. Um, I'm a property owner. That okay, excuse me. Is this Walmart. Sarah? It, Sarah, is this is this Sarah? No, this is not. This is another Susan. Okay, I'm a Susan. Can owner. I 
Okay, Susan, we're going to um, see if the folks from the county wanted to respond first, and I promise we're going to get to you, okay? And we I'm on the phone, so I don't have the I don't have the luxury of being able to press buttons. I'm on the okay. phone. I okay. do want to respond. Susan, we're this. yeah, okay. Thank you so much, and my apologies, folks. Um, what I was asking for wasn't very specific. Anybody from um, uh, from the TSOS effort want to respond to Noah's question? And, and Brooke, this is Dave Stromer. It looks like County Commissioner Josh Slotnick has his hand up to respond also. Okay, great. And I would just ask uh, those of you from uh, the county and from United Way and from the Hope Rescue Mission, um, please don't feel like you need to put your hand up. Um, um, so Josh, would you like to respond? Sure. I, a, a bit of a response. I think some of the other folks who are, are more intimately involved with this on a day to day may have a bit more of an informed response, but I wanted to respond a little bit to Mr. Castle. And first, uh, I'm really sorry you've had to deal with these things. It's awful to have to deal with some of the situations you were describing. And I, I get that there's a lot of stress and involved and it's, it's a rough and terrible thing. And I hear you. A couple of things I wanted to say in response. Um, it did sound like what you were speaking about were problems that are outside of this facility. Uh, people sleeping in parking lots, uh, sleeping in bank vestibules, doing things where they should not supposed to be doing them. Absolutely, these things are totally going on and we are all actively attempting to address this growing problem. Huh. That is outside of the TSOS. And we are talking about today as the TSOS. And, and though these are related, they're not the same things. And I just wanna make sure we don't conflate those two. Huh. You're definitely not being ignored. I would say not a day goes by when the three of us are talking about how are we going to deal with these, with people who are experiencing homelessness, living kind of in the wild, but yet in public and having a huge impact on those around them. And we've taken steps actively to deal with this where people are camped out in front of businesses. It's super awful and super tricky too to tell someone we are forcibly taking you away from one place and putting them in another. It has to be done, but it has to be done thoughtfully and carefully. I just want to make sure we're not conflating that with what's happening within the grounds of the TSOS. These are two separate issues, both very real and live issues, but they're but I, I'm seeing them as separate. So, but you asked about uh, definitions of success, and I think I'll let um, Jim uh, tackle that. Uh, the the point in time homeless count in Missoula has not gone up as fast as people think it has. Has it gone up? Yes. Uh, our our growth rate is less than one percent of homelessness. The growth rate in Seattle is between six and seven percent. And so it's it's they're not coming to Missoula in droves. They've been here. They do, uh, folks do migrate in different places around the city. Uh, but the, the point in time count is right around 342. Uh, and that's, that includes, uh, Mineral County and Ravalli County as, as well. Um, I go by these places as well at different times. Uh, and to be honest, I've not seen the, the growth that is being talked about. Uh, I live in that area, um, and so and and I've I've asked uh, we'll for sure do outreach uh, anytime there's a problem, uh, more than willing to come on site and help. So I mean, uh, it, it's been more than six people. I mean that's it was six or seven people when we talked last, Noah, but it's more than that now. Uh, so it it just continues to 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 grow as far as helping people at the TSOS. And I, I do agree with Josh. There's two different issues uh, that we're, we're talking about. Uh, the people that we've interviewed are not the same people that are TSOS. Um, anyway, that's, I, I, that's all I have. Brooke, if I might weigh in, I'm, I'm Emily Armstrong. I'm the Reaching Home Manager. I lead the 10-year plan to end homelessness with the city. Thank you. 
Awesome. Um, I use she, her pronouns, by the way. So Noah, I just want to speak a little bit more to the your questions around where, you know, what is what is happening to folks? Where are they going? What's the process? Um, and just provide a little context for that piece as well, because the temporary safe outdoor space is a really, it's proven to be a really important component of that process overall. So there's a, a system called the, the coordinated entry system. And that is uh, the system that we created in 2017 to help prioritize folks um, based on greatest need for various housing resources throughout Missoula. And so the temporary safe outdoor space has been brought into that coordinated entry system. And so all of the folks working there are working very closely with case managers, every single one of them. Um, and, and many of them are getting um, connected to this coordinated entry system to hopefully be prioritized for housing resource and eventually get navigated to those housing locations as they open up. There is a housing shortage. We are all so aware of this. Um, and our caseworkers are also working, I would call it magic, but it's not. It's like really dedicated effort um, to get folks into housing places as they open up. So there are folks that are transitioning. It's a slow process and the process is slow regardless of whether there's housing or not because there's just a lot of steps along the way and it's a really challenging process to engage with. But a lot of the work we're doing in the 10-year plan and beyond the 10-year plan is trying to create a continuum of options that meet each level of need where it's at, that meets diff meet in different individuals where they're at in their journey, in their experience, based on their experience. And the temporary safe outdoor space is just one of those places on the continuum that we're trying to create. Our continuum is not complete at all. There's much room for us to work on and we are trying to work on it. We are working on it continually, but part of that process is testing out and building some new places along the continuum to see what works, where can we meet people in new places and bring them in with their experience and and continue to build that continuum so that we're more responsive so that ultimately we have fewer folks living in spaces that are not ideal or not safe for anyone. Um, and so, like I said, this 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 space is serving a really critical on that a critical role on that continuum to try to support folks who are interested and willing and capable of moving forward and really wrapping around them with services to help them in that journey. There are folks who will continue to choose to live outside. Those are not the folks that are staying at the temporary safe outdoor space right now. There's a culture and that space about moving forward. And so that's why it's been such a success in our continuum of options that we're trying to build out. So hopefully that just adds a little bit of context. I do recognize the very real challenges that you express and that I know folks express often around living near folks who are experiencing homelessness. It's real and it's legitimate and I have deep compassion for what that looks like in your businesses and the, the um, folks around the area. And that's as folks of the as the other people on the call have said things that we're trying to work on, but just hopefully providing some context for how it fits into the larger picture and um, the continuum we're trying to build. Thanks. Thank okay, you, Emily. Can, can the public can the uh, public talk now? Friends, um, I will. I will. Is this Susan? It is. OK, Susan, just hang on for just a second. I promise you're going to talk next. OK, um, we you. now have we now have about 77 folks in the room uh, and many folks are wanting to speak. So um, please, please, uh, if you could keep your questions, comments uh, to three minutes, that would be uh, that would be so helpful in just making sure we hear from as many folks as possible. So next, we're going to hear from Susan, who's on the phone. And after Susan, we'll hear from April. OK, Susan. Okay, I'm a property owner that borders Walmart on Brooks, which is Highway 93, and I routinely take back the shopping carts that are taken by homeless people who are transients. They are not necessarily those that are in the encampment, but I will tell you that encampment encourages people who are not qualified or not willing to be qualified in that encampment to be on the ancillary outside perimeter. Those people are also begging in my neighborhood. They are passed out in my front yard. Um, the people who are coming on to Walmart's property and stealing their shopping carts, which cost hundreds of dollars to replace and which if the person was caught would actually could be potentially arrested for a felony 
those people are possibly from that encampment, but probably not. We are dealing with, now you're talking about making that encampment on Highway 93 a permanent fixture in Missoula and providing social services and food and all kinds of lovely things for these people at the property owner's expense. I paid close to $6,000 last year in property taxes in 2020. I'm finishing up paying those in May. I object, and I think you should start feeling sorry for the property owners. I happen to be retired. I think you should start, I mean, all of you lovely people who are concerned about the homeless need to start feeling sorry for the property owners, including the business owners that have to clean up the feces and the damage and have to put up barbed wire to keep people from fording the river. And we also have the silver slipper that enjoys having people come and enjoy their establishment and people from the, either the homeless encampment or people that are attracted to the homeless encampment that do not get approved for it are coming into their establishment and damaging their property and harassing their workers. That is not acceptable. And I don't think any of you seem to care about those people or the property owners. So All right, like Susan. Have a response. Thank you. All right, Susan. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, your voice is very important. Anybody from TSOS uh, who would like to respond to uh, Susan's comments? Yep, um, I'm April Seat, and I do want to respond to those things. Um, I do know that we are doing outreach. We just got enough staff so we can make sure that we are at those businesses and community Wednesday, Thursdays, and Friday. Um, we have done some outreach. But because of staffing issues, we haven't been able to go fully out there. But I do know the staff that we do have now, um, we are watching over the perimeters and whatever other campers that are on this this um, private land. Um, we are working with MDT to see what we can do to work with them to get the folks that are staying underneath the bridge and have that communication as well. Um, but I, I completely understand. I do. I understand. And I want everyone to know that when I say I understand the frustration, I absolutely do. And if there's any way that myself or the staff can come to have conversations with you on, on who is there, I do have a 24 hour number that I can give you and we can come there and outreach those areas. And it will be something that we can do on a you know daily basis if needed. But I, I, I just want to stress that it is not the folks that are staying here. And I know there's an issue. I've been doing this for five years and there's always been an issue here in this area with homelessness. And. Uh oh, all right. Thank you, April. I think we had some technical difficulties um, and I'm not sure. Uh, if I'm seeing hands raised in the order that they were raised. So I'm just going to apologize for that. Uh, but uh, uh, Diane Stensland Vickers. Oh. Hello. Uh, Hi, I'm Diane. I'm a member of the community, and I'd just like to say I support the TSOS, and I'd like to thank the commissioners and the staff at the camp and the Hope Rescue Mission for the work they've done to help the least fortunate among us. That's all. Oh, thank you, Diane. Uh, I don't think there was a question there. Um, let's hear next from Drew. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Drew Richards, and I have a few comments I'd like to address. Uh, first, I'll start by saying I object to this um, situation. I really like to echo what Noah expressed. He really summed up the situation well. I'd like to make some additional points, but strongly agree with Noah's comments. Um, Missoula County, you have the PR machine to get your articles out on the KPAX and to the Missoulian. Us homeowners, we don't have that coalition. However, we do have Nextdoor. There you can see the impact, especially the Buckhouse Bridge, all the trash piles and all of that. And so to go back to Josh Slotnick's comment in regards to Noah saying it ends at that boundary, I just don't agree with that. It is not the impact of the TSOS. 
the TSOS is impacting a lot more outside of those boundaries. And it'd be great if the county commissioners could respect that and the impact. I'd also like to respond to Dave's comment, you know, comparing us to Seattle and that our growth rate is less than Seattle. I hope I never hear that from a county commissioner again. We are not Seattle. It's night apples and oranges. It's not a valid comparison. Also, I object to this because by offering these services, you're attracting greater homeless population because it's well known for these services. The more you give, the more will come. I don't think that's the population we want to come. As Susan, the last commenter said, uh, it's really impacting the property owners. It's making our city and county going down. It's not the community members we want to be attracting to our to Missoula. And the last question I had is, I understand the TSOS is on private land and that landowner is also going forward with the Trinity complex on the west side. It would be great if that could be addressed because it seems like there might be some collusion there as well. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Drew. Uh, folks from the TSOS, uh, comments, information, Yes. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure um, what, uh, well, first of all, I, I also want to say that there's a longstanding problem of homelessness on the south side. Uh, I too live in the neighborhood. I've seen it. We've all had unpleasant encounters, probably none approaching what NOAA reports. And to, Im to imply or state that we don't have, that we're not concerned and we have no compassion, um, I think is incorrect. We might not have solutions, but uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have empathy and uh, sympathy for business and, and local homeowners. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, un I don't understand what collusion, I, I, it's just beyond my understanding why that would be. He's giving us the land, um, I, it, I'm just not equipped to answer that. Yeah, I, I'm not either. We have a we have a lease for a dollar until November, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not sure of his other business. I'll just add the Trinity project is completely separate. That's a homeward and MHA project, and um, that's developing affordable rentals and a navigation center. And so it's just a completely separate effort um, that's not at all tied to the same work. So I just want to make that very clear. Thank you, Emily. Um, let's hear from Katie. Katie, and I'm just, I just, mer I just am not good with last names. <laughs> Hofschild, Katie Hofschild, can we hear from yeah, you? Yeah, that's next, right. Please? Great job. Thank Great you. Job. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of share my opinion. I work over at the Humane Society of Western Montana. So we're on Highway 93, just kind of down the road. Um, and not only are we a local organization near the TSOS, we've also been involved with the TSOS. Um, We've brought some supplies over there. We've sent our trainers and behaviorists to help with the dogs there. And we have also helped kind of care for the pets here in our facility as people are transitioning to permanent housing. Um, and I just wanted to share our experience has been extremely positive. Everyone has been polite, on time for all the appointments, um, really grateful. And it's been an awesome experience and we've been really happy to be able to help. And I just wanted to kind of speak again. I, sorry, I can't remember. I think it was maybe Emily that said the culture there at the TSOS is really just about finding permanent housing. And I wanted to kind of touch on that and say that is what we've seen too. And that people are really working to take these steps forward and we've been really happy to help. And it's always clean and pleasant over there and we've had an awesome experience. So thank you guys for also letting folks keep their pets with them. I mean, I can't imagine going through a housing transition like that and having to give up your pet as well. So I just wanted to say, I think everything, I agree with the success that is being discussed. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, I'd like to uh, check in with all of the folks who are joining us by phone. And uh, we really don't have a good way for you to raise your hand on the phone. But if there is someone on the phone wanting to ask a question or provide a comment, feel free to speak up. Is it press star six to unmute? 
I oh, thank never, you. Thank you. I can never <laughs> keep these Zoom and Teams straight, but that might be the. Susan, what did you say? Press star six. Yes, press star six. Can anybody, star six. Can anybody stop can you, by and visit? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please, um, who are we? Who are we talking with? My name is Faith Musi. Yeah, and I, excuse me. Your first name again? Faith Musi. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm in the Miller Creek neighborhood. Sorry if I'm out of breath. I'm out for a walk here, so I apologize. Um, while I am in full support of people trans transitioning to housing. Um, I just think that we have to be realistic and address the concerns that come along with the population at the TSOS that aren't necessarily ever possibly going to be in that position with mental illness, addictions, or simply people that just don't want to better themselves. And with that, there does come problems that our residences are facing and it's causing many issues and safety concerns. I personally have increased, seen a huge increase in shopping carts around that are being taken. And I would also like to address the fact of my concern for the residences who are crossing the highway out of crosswalk zones. I have personally almost hit two residences when they are crossing as I'm going to turn right onto Brooks and Miller Creek that cross out of their turn. I've had to slam on the brakes. I've all, I have almost hit two women that I have seen repeatedly walking from the TSOS to Walmart. My concern is that someone's gonna be greatly injured or killed. And I would hate for someone to have to live with that. One more story and then I'll be done. I saw a resident of the TSS camp leave Walmart and he was pushing a shopping cart rather than using the crosswalk he started walking towards he was walking against traffic left the shopping cart right by the bridge crossed the highway illegally to get into the camp and that shopping cart blew onto the highway so you have to be realistic about some of the problems that this does cause in the area and you know if we're going to have this camp possibly permanently, how are we going to address the problems that it's causing? We have to be realistic and come up with some solutions where someone isn't going to get killed or, you know, a shopping cart isn't going to cause a major accident that puts other people at harm. Thank you so much for your comment. Anybody from TS and, and your, your overall question, um, anyone from TSOS yeah. want to respond? Uh, so we wanted to introduce you to a few of the folks um, from the TSOS that are here to respond to that, uh, respond to that particular that particular issue because we do have residents out here that are actively working towards changing their situation. Um, and not everybody that is experiencing homelessness is in that situation, but the ones that are ready and willing to move forward are a really great fit to be here at the TSOS. And we do have a waiting list that is well over a dozen deep on a regular basis for folks that do want to be here. So I do want to introduce those to you um, because they're real people like you and me out here, okay? Hi, how's it going? And if you could um, just to kindly provide your first name, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And we are going to ask um, that folks honor the three minute time limit. Thank you. We still have lots of folks that want to want to talk. Did did you have someone? Did you have someone that was going to speak next? Hello. Ashley, did you have somebody? We can see him, but we can't hear him. I think he's trying to talk. Who's in the yurt? The person in the yurt should speak. We can move on and come back, if that makes sense. We just have a lot of folks that want to want to speak, so we'll come back. Okay, 
Um, you Brooke, just on. just very quickly in response to that. I mean, I would say I mean, I am not at this. I am not a site manager and I did hear somebody ask if they could go visit the site and 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 the answer to that is is no. These are these are people's homes and only the staff. There's a very strict no visitors policy. Um, the, it, that that's a legitimate concern, and I think that uh, Jim and April and and Ashley, the site manager, will address that with residents. Um, mental health and addiction issues are terrible problems in our community with inadequate resources. We need to be holding ourselves, our community, our elected officials at all levels accountable for more resources to help address the growing problems that that callers identified and that we're all well aware of. I would also say that we also, every single one of us has had unfortunate, unpleasant encounters with um, people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I just would hope that we wouldn't morph those into all homeless people. When we talk about the homeless, I think we make a mistake. Everybody is homeless for a different reason and uh, we need we need to recognize that. Uh, let me let me address real quick if you can come on site uh, because it is private. We don't uh, we don't encourage people to drop in, but give us a call. You bet we can make an appointment. We can get you on site. So it, that's that's not an issue. It's just that we had some people uh, <laughs> wanting to come and donate stuff that we didn't need and they just wanted to dump stuff. So we just had to say uh, make an appointment and we'll make sure that that happens. That's that's not a problem. Jim. Uh, next, we're, we're going to hear from Amanda Reese, and then we're going to check back in with April. Amanda, are you still with us? Please feel free to unmute. Amanda, are you still with us? Amanda Reese. Hi, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Am I there now? <laughs> You're here. Welcome. <laughs> Teams, here. learning curve. I, um, I'll just keep it really brief. I, I'm a Missoula resident for the past 11 years. I'm a homeowner um, and I work with a nonprofit Open Aid Alliance that serves people that are often um, experiencing homelessness, uh, substance use um, issues and other intersectional things. And I, I support um, the TSOS and all of the efforts um, while understanding that it's a really complex uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Now we're going to check back in with April. April, I think we were having some technical difficulties. Yeah, we're just trying to get everything figured out. I'm sorry. Um, this is Freddie, and he's um, one of the residents here at TSOS. Why don't you speak up and just share a little bit? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Frederick. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm one of the homeless here in Missoula. Uh, I injured myself a few years ago, and um, no one seemed to want to help me, not my family, friends, or anything. And April and a few members of Operation Hope, reached out to me and they gave me a helping hand. They helped me when I needed it. And because of this place, I was able to find a good job and, um, you know, things are looking up. Uh, they give me a, a helping hand with um, things I need in the community as far as work clothes, shoes and stuff like that. And they help me to make sure that I'm clean every day. And, you know, not everyone's here because of drug addiction, drug abuse or anything like that. And, and, not all homeless people sleep out in benches or cause public disturbances. So, you know, it's kind of heartfelt when you're trying to move forward and you got people always looking at negative things. Well, everybody needs a helping hand. If your mother and father weren't there for you, then how would you be where you are today? So now that we need help, there's places like TSOS, the Pabrillo Center, and places like that who with proper help and with wisdom, you can take advantage of. So I thank April and places like this for this, because without this, where would I be now? So for those who think negatively of it, you need to place yourself in our shoes. You know, at one point in your lives, I'm sure you needed someone's help. And it was places like this, maybe in your circumstances that would have helped you. So without places like this, where would people who do need help who aren't drug-induced or mentally-induced 
in some way get it. So without this, where would we be? So you you guys who are quick to say, oh, homeless people do this or homeless people do that. Well, at one point, everybody needs help. So without these places, where would we get our help from? Because the government needs help and places like TSOS give them that help that they need for people like me who are trying to do better and strive better in life. Freddie, thank you so much for uh, for speaking up. Really appreciate it. We are next going to go to M. Smith. And after M. Smith, we're going to go to Devin. In April, we'll come back and check in on you in a couple minutes, if that's okay. All right, got the thumbs up. M. Smith, welcome. Does she know she's muted? Yeah, I think you might be muted. Yeah, I don't see the mute sign. M, M. Smith, are you there? We can't okay. hear you. Okay. Um, the, yeah, and I don't see the mute sign. Um, M. Smith, we're going to come right back to you. If you can locate your icon bar and just check the icon next to the uh, camera icon and make sure it's off. We're going to go to Devin next and we'll come back to M. Smith. Devin, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, forgive me, I actually had to type mine up because I had enough to say that I wanted to make sure it was concise. Um, so um, I know I'm supposed to start off by saying that I'm not heartless and that I understand the issue of people falling down on their luck and needing a hand to help them up. That community support is needed and the complexities of the homelessness are vast and can't be understood by the average person. Even if I say this, there will be plenty of people who will rip my sentiments apart, so I won't try to justify my feelings of compassion and just address the issue at hand. First of all, let's not conv confuse the homeless population with those being affected by the housing crisis in Missoula. That's a separate issue. We are also not talking about homeless families as TSOS is only for individuals and no children. We're specifically talking about the Reserve Street population and our newest Missoula residents who now see Missoula as a destination for homeless people. The TSOS has relocated people from the Reserve Street Bridge as well as continues to publish news segments from the Reserve Street Bridge. So I believe it is relevant and must be considered in our conversations. TSOS camp was originally set up under the guise of a COVID emergency housing, and we all know that was just an excuse. TSOS was already set in motion before the businesses and residences Zoom call last year. The approval was done sneakily without any type of due process. How can the advocates of this program expect the area businesses and residents to be supportive when it was done in such an underhanded way. It was said that it would take 50 residents and would just be temporary. To now say that it was just that, to now say it was stated that it, that's not true, it was voiced by many at the time that it would end up a permanent, permanent structure and expand in size. We were right. Now we're talking about making this larger and a more permanent facility. The TSOS has not at all relieved the Reserve Street Camp problem. That has that was how it was proposed to us originally. Sorry. At the time TSOS was set up, we were told that the following weeks there would be cleanups under the bridge. That did not happen. Or if so, it was a half-hearted effort. Piles of garbage remained or tent sites were removed. Every year a cleanup is done under that bridge. Dump, dump trucks of garbage, human waste, needles, etc. are removed. So far in the last 30 days, you've, you've cleaned up 15 tons. Now we're already seeing an influx of transients moving to Missoula, and it's bef that is before the typical wave of our summer transient population that moves from the south up to the north. Montana is already ranked 15th in the nation of the largest homeless population, and Missoula ranks number one in, in Montana. What are we doing? We're making Missoula a joke. Comparing camping under the bridge is illegal. Bottom line. Why do the laws only apply to me and not the residents under that bridge? It is unsafe for the inhabitants, and frankly, it isn't safe to walk around that area. Why is this camp still running? I know the argument of where will they go. It's safer to have them all in one area. Fires, police calls, thefts, is it safer? Now you want to move that to our neighborhood. It's admirable that you have volunteers and programs wanting to provide help to the truly broken and lost. And I completely support such efforts. But what is being seen and reported about the inhabitants under the bridge is not just broken and lost people. What we are doing is just removing some people from the bridge camp and then allowing the reserve street inhabitants to continually illegally camp and pollute the area. 
In my opinion, the TSOS is a Band-Aid. With that being said, we applaud these seven individuals that have received help and are taking control of their lives and transitioning into their new homes, as well as the limited law enforcement interaction that TSOS has had with the 50 residents. I don't want to take anything away from those successes. However, I feel this proposition is just spreading the problem of homelessness around the community to make other areas unsafe. While we are given reassurances about the protocols and staffing in place, I worry that increasing the population will stretch out or the resources thin the Pavarello has already stated that the increase in their population and loosening up the zero alcohol policy led to higher opportunities for conflict. So if you can tell me honestly, honestly that you would allow you your child to walk down the reserve street path, or you would allow your child to now ride their bike down to Lolo and back, I wouldn't. Well, this is just the opinion of perhaps an Thanks, overprotective Deb. parent. Hi, I feel it's- Devin, sorry not I to cut you off. To um, you're, uh, we're at three minutes, so. Um, if sure. we could just move on. Thank you so much for your comments. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. And we'll go back now to M. Smith. Give M. Smith a try. Yeah, it should be working now. I had my internal camera or my internal microphone off. Um, Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask the county commissioners, um, how important is you know, are the public comments when you receive them from people in the community? Like how heavily does that weigh on your decision making? A quick yes or no. One and through ten, I have a follow-up question. I just want to ask that first. Yeah, this is Dave Stromeyer. Uh, yeah, comment is absolutely important and that's why we are here today. Okay, um, I guess then I'm just kind of confused how the first time around with 37 public comments against the TSOS and only six in favor and about five kind of on the fence or, you know, had some questions about it, you know, how we, how it passed in the first place, how it went through, um, you know, and I know that it was said earlier today that um, there actually hasn't been a rise in homelessness in Missoula, um, you know, 1% or something. So why was this touted as a response to COVID if there was not, a difference in um, the homeless population, a notable difference, because um, that was the big thing was like, we have so many more homeless people now because of COVID. So we're gonna use this emergency funding to start this camp. Um, I'm not saying I'm against the camp. I think it's great if people can find resources. Um, I'm, you know, but I think that you're having a problem with community buy-in. Um, people are seeing that it, it does feel like, even though you guys say it's not true, it does feel like to the people in the area, that it was tried to, you know, slip it under the radar. Um, there was a email from the DNRC in the public comment saying that you guys didn't even go through the correct permitting process before beginning. Um, so I, yeah, it does feel that way, whether you guys say it's true or not. And I guess I just think that if maybe it was made a nonprofit, because ultimately I feel like my public comment doesn't matter. You guys allowed it to go through in the first place without any public support at the time. So why you're holding this just feels like you're checking a box um, so that you can move forward with whatever you guys wanna do. Um, so I guess if you're gonna move forward with support or without support, I would suggest maybe having a panel, a board of people who work with you guys, um, community members, business owners in the area who can be a part of it and be part of the, uh, with the County Commissioner's United Way and Hope Rescue Mission, maybe to oversee it. Um, and also, I think that you guys need to be more transparent this has happened and it feels like kind of a slap in the face to your constituents who are obviously not being considered um and also there needs to be some sort of plan for growth if you are going to keep it going there should be a limit on tents a limit i mean 100 tents out there i mean when is there going to be enough because i'll tell you probably never homelessness is a huge problem and as far as helping people who need the help and want the help i'm all for that but there has to be some sort of community involvement so you're not leaving the businesses and the residents behind Thanks. Oh and the one thing I would just add, and, and I don't want to take much time because we still have a lot of hands up is, and folks might not like to hear this, but it is uh, oh, uh, when it comes to issues like this, uh, public comment is taken in and uh, there were plenty of folks uh, <clears throat> to go when this first started that were supportive. So it wasn't unanimously opposed to what has uh Gone well, the in. public the comment on the county commission website and, only has six. Oh, and so the other piece that I just want to emphasize is with any of the decision making or deliberation 
that we make as the Board of County Commissioners, we, we're we not just tallying up uh, numbers of folks pro and con. It's also a matter of deliberating on uh, the substance of what folks are are proposing or suggesting. And so it's it's a complex decision-making process. Could Thank I just you, David. Add, add to that a bit, Dave, if that's all right? Um, yeah. Brooke, yeah, absolutely. One of the other commissioners and speaking to Ms. Smith, I mean, we're here listening and I totally hear you. We absolutely hear what, you, what you're saying. And I think uh, involving uh, some more community members and people from businesses, it, it, that's a great idea. The more people we can get uh, involved in advice and consent, et cetera, uh, conversation, uh, the better. I do want to say, um, when you asked about homeless populations increasing, folks who are at the POV are homeless or experiencing homeless. And instead of being sheltered in the POV, they had to leave because of COVID. And this was a response to where we, where could we put them if they were not going to be in the POV. I also want to add that were it not for the TSOS, there would be upwards of 30 folks living in the wild in an urban area contributing negatively in all the ways that have been described that no one would dispute. Were it not for the TSOS, it sounds to me like we need more places to put people or they would be out there living in the urban wild behaving in the ways that no one wants. And somebody said this is a band-aid. You're right, it's a band-aid. We can't go quickly upstream and make it so that people had great families and good fortune and went to school and everything all worked out. What we're dealing with is a consequence of a whole lot of bad of misfortune. If we did not do this, these people would be living in our midst in a ways that everyone objects to. So the, the, the job we have right now is to figure out how can we take care of folks and mitigate the consequences of this so it doesn't have negative impacts on people who live nearby. That's the puzzle and it's something we're actively striving to do. And if it was easy, it would have been done. If it was possible to be perfect, it would have been done. We're proceeding imperfectly, with all our effort and absolutely hearing what you have to say. Doc, thank you so much. And I also want to apologize uh, to Devin. Devin, I did not uh, go back to our TSOS folks to see if anybody uh, wanted to comment on, on uh, your questions and your comments. So I want to do that right now. Um, anybody want to comment on Devin's? Um, I guess I would just differentiate and ask people to differentiate between the illegal, unsafe, unstaffed, zero services, reserve street encampment, and the safe, secure, service-rich environment of the TSOS. And also, you know, we're not just talking about the seven people who have found housing. Every single person who has stayed of the 53 people who have rotated in and out of the TSOS, every one of them has taken some sort of step toward a better, healthier, more self-sufficient life whether it's addressing addictions, whether it's uh, getting IDs, getting jobs. Um, uh, I don't know. You, those of you who are on site every day can fill me in, but it's not yeah, just, yes, the ultimate goal is housing. Uh, in, a, in a community with a near 0% rental vacancy rate, housing is a challenge, especially for the people who face the biggest barriers to housing, including the people who are staying at the TSOS. So it's not just seven people it's it's everybody one life at a time ending homelessness isn't easy and it isn't cheap and it does take the involvement of of everybody and including people who describe themselves and who i have every reason to believe are truly compassionate and caring and i think it's unfortunate that you think that those of us who um champion the tsos don't think that you're compassionate and caring people because that simply that simply isn't true. Thank you, Susan. I just want to acknowledge that we are at 1 p.m., which was the stated uh, time for our time together. And we still have folks that want to ask some questions. So I'm going to defer to uh, our TSOS folks about next steps. Um, next steps, uh, written comment, next steps, uh, stay on the line for a few more questions. Um, what are your thoughts, TSOS folks? I see a thumbs up from Susan, mm -hmm. it, it, meaning yeah. you want to stay yeah, on I for just a little bit longer? 
Yeah, I think we had also uh, talked about it going for another 30 minutes if we needed to. So we'd be we'd be more than more than happy to do that. Do we have consensus? Just, do we have consensus? Is anybody objecting to that from the TSOS folks? Can everybody stick around? Yeah, we're good. OK, go ahead, Jim. I'm so sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, we have 20 sites out there, not not 30 or 50. Uh, we only have 20. Um, when the emergency edict is lifted, we don't know when that will be, but when that is lifted, then we will have to go through all the regulatory procedures to remain there. Um, so that means the zoning, air quality, and the floodplain uh, issues. Uh, so this was stood up, not underhanded, but because of the reduction of uh, residents at the Pavarello and to help those that wanted to out of reserve, uh, reserve street encampment, to help them get established. And the reason we could is we had the zoning variance from the Office of Emergency Management regarding the COVID. That's, that's how it got stood up. It wasn't under the table or anything else. It was through the COVID helping those people that we could because of uh, Pavarello going to, and Emily, you would know for sure, going to about half capacity, which was 70, I think about 70 people that were 88 people that were were put out and so that's that's why um all of this uh, took place thank you jim let's a question for the commissioners in regards to their uh comments if i could just real quick yes is are, is, are you on the phone sir yes ma'am would you be willing to identify yourself ray davis thank you ray uh, I'm just curious for the ones that it is working out on the site for. That's fantastic. I'm all for that. Uh, I'm curious for the ones that it doesn't work out there for. What is being done with them? Are they being transported elsewhere or just being put out the front gate? Uh, April would, I don't know if she's on this, but uh, yeah. we, had, we okay. did have one. Uh, go ahead, April. You know better than I do. Um, yeah, if it's not working out, we are working with several other services to make sure that we're not putting them back out into homelessness. We also work with the mobile support team from the fire department and case management. So if it's not a good fit, then there's um, really other barriers that we have to deal with. So we are trying to find areas of like um, like nursing homes for folks that are not doing well, the other group homes that we have helped out with and recovery places. Um, and if there is some um, like the bad behavior type stuff, we are willing to figure out what we can do before just kicking them back out into, you know, back to reserve or to the Pavarello. And we do work close with the Pavarello to see what we can do to make sure that we're not, you know, just throwing folks out. So it's not a, a process of you can't be here and get out. We're actually still working with them to find a positive solution for them. It's just not going to work for them here on site. April, thanks so much for asking that. I'm wondering, did you have someone else there that wanted to speak? Yeah, I have one more, and then I have a staff member that would like to share. I, I'd like okay. to. This might be a good time since we're yeah. already connected. So Thank is, you. This is Reggie. He's one of our residents. And then after that, it'll be Brandon Brown. Hi, my name is Reggie. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Reggie Ortega. Um, all I know is that, you know, it's really easy for um, there to be like all this money for all these programs and all this stuff. But if you don't know how to actually work those programs and don't know how to get that money from those programs, you're in the same boat and you're not going to go anywhere. With the staff here, like we were having that problem, there are a lot of us that don't want to be here and want to be productive members of society and stuff. And there's not a safe place to go. You've all, I've heard everybody complain about underneath the bridge over there. I don't want to be under that bridge. I know my wife don't want to be underneath that bridge, and I definitely know that we don't want to be homeless. And I know this program here is like a, a godsend for me and my and my wife. I've lost my kids because I'm homeless. I'm now getting my kids back as soon as we get a house. I would have never been able to get a house fast and been able to work and utilize all these programs if it weren't for their staff out here. And I definitely wouldn't have been able to find a safe place to do that from where I know that my stuff would be there when I got home. 
My wife works a full time job, but just because you got money in your pocket, sure, we could go stay in a hotel, you know. But then what are we going to do from there when we're spending all our money for a hotel, which costs you $2,000 a month to stay in? And not to mention that you have to eat out all the time because you don't have the facilities to be able to cook and store your food to eat properly and to buy enough food to where it's to make your food stamps last all month or if you're, you know, to do all that. And then you're in the same boat and you're not going anywhere. And all I can say is that this place was, we could have went and camped under the bridge like everybody else, but we didn't feel safe, you know? And that's not a place that we we, would have been able to get out from under, you know? I mean, I feel bad for those people under there, but if they wanted to change their programs to help them too. This is a program that was a godsend that wasn't there. there. And all I can say is there's not a bunch 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 under the bridge there. It's not working programs here. These people are helping us work the programs and actually find some place to go instead of just being here partying and hanging out, you know, and that's, I mean, and I know that it affects the businesses, but, the, but to not fix the problem, then, and just to complain about the problem, I haven't seen any of those people that are complaining actually come down here and see what's going on. I see them doing a lot of complaints, but I haven't seen a single person from, from, from that's complaining actually come down here and see what they could do to actually help. And which would actually help them in the long run and resolve a lot of their problems that they're complaining about. You know, there's safety here. We have security here. There's not a bunch of people using drugs here. We don't have people drinking here all night. Alcohol is not allowed here on site. You know, we don't have people coming back here drunk because they're going out and, you know, everybody's working, working the system here to try to get, to try to get all this help that's supposedly supposed to be there. Well, it's hard to get that help if you don't know how to get it. And if you don't have somebody, like all these different case managers helping each other help programs and help us because one program just can't help you. This is a combination of programs and a combination of different people working together. And that's what it's going to take to like cure this problem instead of just like put a bandaid on it. Everybody just talks about a bandaid. We'll stop putting a bandaid on it, period. But I'm glad that I got this bandaid because at least the bandaid's stopping the bleeding. You know, I mean, otherwise it's just going to keep going. And everybody can complain about it, but what is anybody can actually do about it? We owned our own house a year and a half ago. This is not what we expected when we sold our house. And now we're stuck here. And if we didn't have these people to help us, we'd be stuck in without our kids for who knows how long. And at least I know that I have an end in sight. So I can complain about this later on. But I won't complain. I'll actually come and I'm going to help and try to see what I can do to help. Yeah. Maybe some of you guys should try to do the same thing instead of complain so much. Why don't you come down here and see what you can do? You know, that's all I'm saying. Come down and see for yourself what this place is about. And you might change your mind. And then go down and look underneath the bridge and see what that's like. And then tell me if this isn't, doesn't help. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Reggie. April, you have one more one more person? How's it going? Uh, my name is Brandon Brown. And uh, <clears throat> so I just wanted to share some stuff. I, I've been out here um, since the, the site started out. And uh, when I found out um, and met with April and uh, and found out what was going on and taking place out here, um, I was all for it. I put in my two weeks at my job and I came out here because I once was homeless and I once was a drug addict and I grew up in Missoula, Montana. And I know that when I was going through, you know, my struggles and my trials and tribulations, you know, growing up here in Missoula, that... Um, you know, having people that actually took the time to make a relationship with me and actually showed me that they really cared, it made the world for me. And now I own my own home, I'm married, I have children at home, and my life has completely changed. And so, um, you know, I wanted to be a part of this. And since I've been here, since the site has opened up, I have seen miraculous things happen. I have seen people lay down needles. I have seen people <clears throat> get uh, sobriety under their belt, reach out for help. Um, because not only, you know, are we, are we having all these resources here, but we're taking our time and we're making relationships with people. And, and, and when suicide and even with all this COVID-19 and all of this, it is putting our world in such a dark place. So be able to <clears throat> sit down with people and, and be, uh, you know, uh, um, a set of ears for to just listen, 
to just listen and let these people vent and talk about the problems and the things that they've been through in their life. It has impacted so many people. Um, I've seen sobriety. I've seen people go into treatment, people that were suicidal, um, you know, now are working and doing good. So not a set aside from the housing part, there has been so many huge successes here and it's a, it's a daily thing, you know? Um, and you know, I see, the stuff going on in Missoula. I also live in this area in this side of town and, and I, I love it, you know, and, and I understand like the concerns that businesses and stuff have, those have nothing to do with this site. Um, and you know, I just, I, I, I love this place. I love seeing what it's doing and, and helping people. Um, there's been so many, so many good things and happening out here and it's just awesome, you know, um, and, and just kind of like, uh, Reggie was saying, you know, even my motivation for coming out here is like, you know, talking about the problem, about the problem and being a part of the solution are two different things. And so I'm here and I'm here to help and, and be part of that solution, you know, and it's awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you, Brandon. We are going to go to uh, Pila next. And friends, I just want to um, remind everyone that uh, we really do want to hear from everyone. And so if you could uh, keep it to three minutes, that would be super helpful. Uh, Pila, are you there? Yep. Hi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pela Hoyt. And I, oh, that's okay. I, I see this as a, a compassionate, a smart, and an innovative approach. I understand that it's part of a larger strategy we have here in this community. And I just want to want to thank the County Hope Re Rescue Mission and United Way and the landowner for, for taking this on. I really appreciate what you're doing out there. Thank you so much. And uh, my apologies uh, with not getting your name correct. Thank you. No um, could we hear from Winifred next, please? Hello, Winifred. Hello. Um, can, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, excellent. Um, my name is Winnie Lohoff. I am the path care coordinator at Western Montana Mental Health Center. Um, I work with the TSOS um, pretty frequently. I'm up there every single Thursday from one to five. Um, and I work with my clients out there. I've also done a lot of outreach under the bridge. And I will tell you the passion of my clients moving from under the bridge to the TSOS camp has been absolutely amazing. I've been able to house um, two clients officially and move out, or three clients officially, um, and move two clients out of the TSOS camp, thanks to me being able to actually access them. The, the Reserve Street camp, you know, it, has, it definitely has its problems. And personally, I don't feel safe going under there by myself. But at the TSOS camp, I can go out and I can see my, my clients every single day whenever I need to and make sure that not only are they okay, but they're getting where they need to be. As a housing navigator, I have, I, I'm working very closely with property management companies here in Missoula. And the biggest thing it, with housing the homeless is the lack of addresses, the lack of rental history, the lack of good credit. There are certain property management companies that refuse to house my clients because they are homeless. But with the TSOS camp, my clients actually have an address for the first time in 11 years. I can actually say, hey, you can call this person. They have a reference. And because of that, I've gotten three clients housed. That's amazing. My clients are some of the most kind and compassionate people you will ever meet. Dedicated. They are dedicated mm -hmm. more than 99% of people I have ever met. They want, they don't want to be there. Why would they want to be there? Why do you want to have to um, winterize your tent in the middle of a field when it's rainy out, when it's snowing out, when it's blizzarding out? I would, Personally, I would rather be in my house, even if I have to deal with a bunch of roommates. So our clients don't want to be out there as much as you don't want to be out there, but it is a significant, significant difference. Um, someone on here earlier said that the housing crisis is not related to the TSOS camp. It is. It 100% is. We have clients out there who have full-time jobs, who have 
nicer car. Like they have 2014 circa cars. They have full-time jobs. They are working hard. They got evicted because, you know, they couldn't afford the rent anymore. So yeah, this is all related. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Missoula girl. I grew up here. I'm, I was born here. And the way I see Missoula and Montana as a whole is that we help our community. And that's what the TSOS camp is doing. They are helping our community in the best way possible. I'm hearing people say that they don't want more homeless people. And yeah, I don't want more homeless people. I want to get them housed. And this is the biggest step towards housing that I've been able to come across. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for your comment. Um, let's hear from Michelle Lopez next, please. Michelle, are you there? I am. Welcome. So yeah, my name is Michelle Lopez and I just wanted to express my support for the TSOS. I'm a Missoula community member and a housing navigator who helps folks with chronic health issues find and maintain housing. And I've seen firsthand how the housing shortage here in Missoula has affected people, especially those with significant housing barriers. Um, I've also seen how having spaces such as TSOS has allowed our neighbors to really have a place to exhale and the space to really think about moving forward. Um, although these folks are unhoused, Missoula is their home. Um, this like not in my backyard mentality that um, a lot of folks share will only like allow this issue to continue. So homelessness will continue as long as folks' basic needs aren't being met and terminating spaces such as this um, and all of the issues that opposed community members and business owners that we've been speaking of um, won't end because this temporary shelter suddenly goes away. It'll only make transitioning folks into housing even harder. And with that, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for yielding the rest of your time. Thanks so much. Um, friends, I want to invite anyone on a telephone call, the first, first one who would like to speak, to unmute themselves by using star six. Um, if there's, I just have no way of knowing if, uh, if you want to speak or not. So there's a general call to all of you um, amazing folks who have hung on uh, by the phone this long time to unmute uh, with star six and, and uh, we welcome you. Anybody out there? Just wait a second here. And if, if there's anybody like me who's a little technologically challenged. Um, okay, let's go to Josh, Josh Decker, please. He's no longer on the line. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm just scrolling through my list and um, let's see, Kevin, did, did we have Kevin, Ken and Lisa? Is your hand up? Yes, that's right. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, well, thank you guys for your thoughts and, and everything that's been said. Um, I think there's a, uh, two different stories going on here, and I appreciated hearing some of the impact from what's going on inside the TSOS, um, though it does bring up, um, you know, this cause and effect nature that the TSOS being brought to this side of town and what that has brought with it. Um, I am uh, not heartless. I do have strong empathy. Um, for the scenarios that are taking place. Um, but I, I find it hard to deny what my own eyes see. And I am uh, a resident in the area. I have noticed the uptick in uh, foot traffic in carts um, and individuals walking around um, and trying to identify the difference between what's happening inside the establishment and outside the establishment as Josh had pointed out, are two different issues. Um, it would be very helpful as a resident who has a family uh, in the area to identify that what is happening outside is the major issue for the community um, that lives in this area. 
And it, I find it very difficult to distinguish between the individuals who are um, getting help and uh, who are uh, taking the TSOS seriously and those individuals who are not a part of it, but I can't distinguish between them. So I would very much like to hear um, just either thoughts or if you guys have addressed, you know, how visibly um, can we distinguish these individuals? Are there going to be any kind of um, items or ID or something that helps me identify, oh, let's not put our, our anger or frustration towards the TSOS if they're not the ones causing the problems, but having this that here is what attracted people in who are causing these problems. Um, it's a it's a serious issue, and uh, just trying to be proactive with how do we identify the difference between these, and um, and finally, uh, just a question of, you know, this location being next to the river and the highway, and literally one of the first stops within a certain radius is a bar, does not seem to be um, ideal for a location for, for it being permanent. I do understand how something temporarily can serve a need um, and help be a stop gap for a period of time. But as a permanent location, uh, I'm looking up on the Missoula County website right now about it being in a hundred year floodplain. Uh, I'm looking at the proximity to the river and the highway. Uh, these are real sincere concerns from a resident who wants to protect the people who are seeking to get help as well as the people who have chosen this as their home and plan to be here long term. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Our TSOS folks, would you who would like to respond? Um, I will real quick. We have purchased some. Um, they're the black fold up like wagons. So if they do go to the store and come back, um, they do sign those out and sign them back in. And we do have three of them. So. Those are the folks that like when they go to the store, they are signing them in and out. And I do, we have record of that. So we know when they're taking it and when they're bringing it back. Um, and to distinguish them all the time, I, that's, that's going to be really hard. I don't want to tag folks and, you know, just tag them so they can separate them from anything. I just don't think that that's humane, first of all. And second of all, it's like we, we, we also want them to be able to still continue to feel safe to go do what they need to do without being represented in a way of, you know, um, with, with the others that are staying out there. I mean, it's just it's just not something that we're, we're even we even thought about or would do to, to mark them like that's just the way that I I just don't see it would do any good. But um, you're more than welcome to give us a call and um, we can. You can come on site and you all can visit and maybe that's a way that we can distinguish some of these folks, how we can help and move forward with what we're doing. April, do you feel comfortable uh, sharing uh, uh, that phone number when you say you, you're welcome to call? Yep, it is. Let me get it. Jim, what's your cell phone? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it is um, 406 802 four three zero nine and that number is a 24-hour number to our temporary safe outdoor space to schedule any time to come in and speak or any concerns or issues that are going around in the in the resident in this area definitely be able to call that number at any time and we can um we can come on site or have those conversations april why don't you repeat it just repeat the number again all right it's um four zero six eight zero two Four three zero nine. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Thanks so much, April. Friends, um, it, it looks like um, we're just going to hear from Lisa, and then I'm going to check in with Winifred, who um, has her hand up again, and then we're going to come to a close. Um, and uh, gosh, what a great, uh, what a great turnout. Uh, Lisa, are you with us? Hey, oh, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa. I am a housing navigator really, with the coordinated entry system here in Missoula. I've been serving people who experience homelessness in Missoula since 2015 in various capacities. Um, currently, I serve folks who have experienced chronic homelessness for years. 
And I just want to echo Winnie's statements. When people have a safe space to be, where they can have meetings with their provi service providers, we see results so much quicker than we do when they are just out making it on their own. Um, things like access to a telephone or just, yeah, just a safe place to be, it makes all the difference um, when it comes to trying to help people get housed in our community. Um, <laughs> I also want to note on a personal note um, that homelessness has existed in our community for, you know, virtually forever. Um, and it, it's important that people know that people are there, they're struggling and they need support. And I, just because you see someone walking on the street doesn't mean they're homeless. It might mean that they're homeless. Um, I just want everyone to remember that we're human beings who are just trying to make it in this world and all need support and hope and help. Um, so that's all I wanted to add to the conversation. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, Winfred, are you, I see that your hand is raised. Did you wanna? Yes, um, just really quick. I wanted to say that if, if you are um, seeing an escalated homeless person or are concerned about someone, please call the hot team at the Pavarello. They will be able to help. A lot of the time they will be able to deescalate the situation. Um, also, I just wanted to throw out something that I totally forgot to say is that because I'm able to go visit my clients out of the TSOS camp, I've gotten almost all of my clients uh, interacting with mental health services. I would not have been able to do that if I was downtown, down um, under the reserve street, street bridge. Um, and also, yeah, you. If you have questions about the homeless, please give me a call because the housing in Missoula is terrible and I I want to help people understand what's going on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Josh, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Uh, thanks, I'm sorry I missed you earlier when you called on me. I was just moving around the block here. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone that is on this call that is working in service to um, help ameliorate the problem of our unhoused neighbors that, that our unhoused neighbors face in the community. Um, I support the temporary safe outdoor space. I support it becoming a permanent space. And I could talk on this subject for a long time. I will try and be brief. The, uh, first of all, if you are opposed to this project and you find yourself making a statement that is i have empathy but i think that that statement bears some self-analysis and i think that people that are making statements that say i have empathy i care i'm concerned but really need to look within and try and figure out the source of where that's coming from within themselves um, some of the things that I've heard lead me to believe that we might need an increase in the uh, in the crosswalk uh, situation in that area. Uh, one thing that Missoula desperately needs, um, since we're all human animals um, and we're all human beings, you know, we all have biology, is public restrooms. Let us work towards public restrooms that would alleviate some problems that occur when folks have to do the natural functions that their body requires. Um, human dignity starts with small steps like providing people a place to go to the bathroom. So let's move towards that. And I think that would al alleviate a lot of the concerns that say uh, a silver slipper owner has um, or or others, you know, if there was uh, public restrooms placed throughout the town. Um, I, uh, again, I, I'll just reiterate that I support the temporary safe outdoor space and uh, I appreciate your time. Josh, thanks so much. And I, I thank everybody, everybody who joined us today for this really important uh, session. Um, thank everybody who spoke up. 
uh, your voice is so important and it was listened to. Uh, I can uh, I can just feel all the listening energy out there. And uh, thanks so much for every, everybody for listening. I would love to uh, ask any of our TSOS friends if they have any closing thoughts or comments that they would like to share before we come to a close. Um, I know, I know Rick, April probably does, but just let me say real quick, uh, man, we are open to any property. We're, we're not married, so to speak, to this property. We vetted a, a few pieces, quite a few pieces before we started this. So boy, we're, there, there's nothing magical. In fact, this property has a lot of roadblocks as we go forward uh, to meet all the regulatory uh, standards that we need to make. So, hey, listen, if there's some property out there, please let us know. We would be glad to check it out. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you to everyone. I know some of these comments are hard and they can be frustrating, but I really do take it um, with heart and what we can do to better improve on the community that we are serving here and the residents and this area in general. So there are definitely things that we have taken note on and that we are going to work together as a team to be able to not only give back to the res residents we serve, but the community around us. So I just look forward to, to whatever partnerships that we can make. And um, really, I do love the idea of having more of the community together and we can have those conversations out you know, openly. So those, the, that's encouraging to me and knowing that there are fr some frustrations, it's okay. It just makes us be able to do our jobs better. I just you, wanna, I, can I just quickly echo that? I really thank you everybody for, you know, you've, you've, you've there, there, there are problems that, you know, we can't fix things we don't know about. So thank you for letting us know about some of the problems you're experiencing. And, and, you know, the, the gentleman who said, I, I, you know, I see with my own eyes and, and of course, Noah, we, we are aware of the challenges that, and problems that you face. And, you know, we are, we are in this business to fix problems, not fix blame. Um, we understand that everybody, I, I believe everybody is innately compassionate and cares. We might disagree on how to get there, but um, we are going to continue to do everything we can, as we have for a long time, um, to make homelessness in Missoula rare, brief, and one time only. And we invite you to join us. We don't all have to, you know, agree, um, but we all have to be committed to solutions. And just thank you for your time. And I will. Turn it over to Josh Slotnick, who I think wants to say something. Thank you, thank Susan. Thanks, Brooke. So uh, first, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who who spoke. This is a really hard thing to talk about. Uh, it's it it's hard to hold these two things simultaneously. One hand, a person does actually feel empathy for those they see living in squalor and living hard lives, and also feel concerned about your own personal safety. And these two things can be held simultaneously. I get that. Life is really complicated. So I want to commend people for speaking up on these on these hard things. I also want to commend you for uh, sharing, as Susan pointed out, some of the problems that could be associated with this so we know what to fix. I have a list of notes here that I'm sharing with uh, with folks on the line right now and things we, things we can do. I do want to caution us going forward not to conflate all of the pieces of this issue. There are people camping illegally, trespassing at Reserve Street and living in horrible conditions. That's not the TSOS. There are people you see milling about, sleeping, taking shopping carts, being in places that are not supposed to be. That is not the TSOS. The TSOS doesn't welcome anyone who comes there. You have to live there and it's got security and 24 seven staff. This is an answer so that we don't have people living in the way I just described, in the urban wild, in a way that hurts them and is frightening to others. So I, I wanna caution us not to blend all these things together, though it's, as somebody said, it's really hard to distinguish who's who. I also really wanna be careful that we don't get in the business of doing that. That is, that is kind of sci-fi scary. We're not uh, demanding papers from each other. We're not putting armbands on one another. We're not, we're not doing that. We're treating everybody with dignity. And that includes the residents and business owners and people who live at the TSOS and even the people who are pushing shopping carts and talking to themselves. Everybody deserves their slice of dignity. So thank you. Thank you, 
Yeah, uh, Brooke, if I can just jump in here. Uh, thanks so much, Brooke, for uh, moderating today's event uh, to the United Way, Susan, uh, Eric out there somewhere, to Hope Rescue Mission, April, Jim, and uh, and for the bravery of the residents uh, uh, at uh, at the TSOS to be able to share with us today, which was, was very impactful. As uh, Commissioner Slotnick mentioned, I have a notebook here full of, of scribbles from today's meeting, and I look forward to going back with our partners and seeing what we can do to mitigate some of the concerns we've heard. To echo Jim's comments, is this location and site the ideal place for such a thing? Absolutely not. Uh, I think even months ago, we identified this uh, when we had a willing property owner come forward as maybe the best of bad options. If folks are out there and have ideas of property uh, or are willing to offer up their own in uh, in such a regard, uh, we are all ears. We're looking for a way to navigate our way through a difficult situation to house the unhoused, to provide shelter to the unsheltered. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, participating and offering your voices today. I just wanted to give one more shout out to Freddie and Reggie and Brandon that it's courageous to stand up to a group like this and uh, just I really appreciate them being here and I'm really thankful they were willing to chat. So April, please pass my thanks to them. Maybe I'll pop down and say thank you myself one sometime this week. And yeah, just echo everything everyone else said. We're working hard on all of this and it doesn't happen without the community. So I really appreciate everyone taking time to be here and share your thoughts and um, just want to offer myself up as another person to communicate with if you have ideas or um, things you want to talk through. Homelessness is an extremely massive, complex, systemic issue that has so many other factors at play, and um, we're doing our best to see all of them, but we're not perfect either. As Josh said earlier, we're, we're doing this imperfectly and just doing our best. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, and, and thanks to Freddie, Reggie, and Brandon for also being part of that. Thank you, Emily. Any other last thought, comment from the TSOS folks? Once again, thank you, everyone. We had a just a, almost everybody stayed on the entire time. Thank you for your time, your energy, uh, and your good hearts. Um, let's go out there and uh, continue to make it a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke.